Hi everyone, I'm Philip. I'm here today to talk about what I learned from sockets. I work at Bloomberg. They're a cool company. They do lots of C++. Check them out. So the agenda for today. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about sockets, and then quite a bit about select, and how these things can be implemented in C++ to help us. And at the end, if there's time, I'll mention a bit about senders, receivers, and coroutines, and how these concepts apply to them. But before that, I'd like to kind of start with the answer. What did I actually learn from sockets? And first, an observation. I find that most concurrent code uh, breaks down into three steps. The first step is the initial setup, then the wait, and then after we are done waiting for whatever concurrent thing we're doing, we react to the result. But uh, the stuff before and the stuff after, that's just regular straight line code. It's the wait that's interesting. And that raises an interesting question. How do we wait? What do we do while waiting? And uh, we have a few options. One is to suspend the calling thread. That's basically equivalent to no concurrency, uh, just doing a regular blocking call. The other option I've seen is to yield control to some executor, for instance, uh, call await. And the third option is to busy wait, which is actually not a terribly bad idea in some situations. But there's another question I'd like to bring up, which is, what is it that we're waiting for exactly? The most common thing I see is that we do one operation, and then we wait for it to complete, and we do the next, and so on. Another one is to wait for a whole bunch of operations to complete, kind of like a when-all. But I posit that the more fundamental thing is to wait for any of several operations to complete. Like when any, but not exactly. And I'll be getting into the differences over the course of the presentation. The other things I learned from sockets is to break the code up into parts that wait and parts that don't. Most code is regular code, or math. Like algorithms, just stuff that can happen locally without the need for concurrency or waiting like string parsing, business logic, this is most code. And uh, this is reasonable code. We like this kind of code, it's easy to think about, it's easy to test. The rest of the code is the code that waits, and ideally, what I found works for me, is when this code just glues the regular code together. Then we can just deal with the complicated parts here without worrying about the rest of the business logic. And when waiting, I find it helpful to wait for several things. In fact, really, really powerful and flexible algorithms can be built up this way. And finally, after we wait, we react based on what has happened. And here's a little quote. Don't communicate by sharing memory. Share memory by communicating. And what I get from this quote is, if we restrict communication between different domains using sockets, then that can make code a whole lot simpler. And before I get into everything else, I'd like to start with a conclusion. In the summary of my talk, I seized these questions. How do I get the first of several futures? How do I co-wait the first of several awaitables? And how can I select several senders? Well, unfortunately, for futures, I don't think STD future is going to let us. I, I don't see it happening. Now, for awaitables, uh, the first step is to make them all look like senders. And for senders, is to make them look like sockets. And once we do these things, it becomes possible to wait for several at once. And the reason is because select requires cooperation. The thing producing the result needs to do something more in order to notify any waiters that it has done so. And select itself is an operation that waits for one of several things. Well, it can be a sender. And that's kind of cool, I think. Now, a little remark, a lot of this is from my reading of the proposal for sender's receivers. This is kind of new to me, and I don't claim to understand it all that well myself. 
Fortunately, there are lots of other people at this conference that do, and uh, we're very lucky because of that. So first, I'd like to do a little introduction to sockets. We'll talk about reading and writing, what makes sockets different, and blocking versus non-blocking. There will be code, and I'll have to go a little fast because there's lots of material, but I'll do my best to make it understandable. So, reading and writing is kind of a basic protocol for transferring data. The thing I want to draw attention to is the return. Read returns an integer, and that integer can have several meanings. If it's greater than zero, then it represents how many bytes of data we read. If it is equal to zero, then that's the end of file. No more data after this. Otherwise, there's some error, something else happened, and we better check error now. Write follows a similar protocol. It also returns an integer. If an integer is greater than zero, then that's how many bytes we wrote. If it is equal to zero, that's kind of the end of file, or another way to interpret it is that the device being written to is out of space. Otherwise, it's an error. Now, sockets build on this protocol. The initial stuff is different. We have to create a socket. We have to connect it to some address. And here, the address happens to be Bloomberg.com. But after we have done this, we get to pretend that a socket is just a file. We write the HTTP request to the socket, and then we read out the response. And I'd like to take a moment to uh, kind of remark on this. In, in two slides, I can establish a connection and then fetch a web page. I am omitting some error checking, but not much. So, so this is kind of an achievement, I think. But there is another difference. These read and write calls are potentially blocking calls. And to explain what I mean by that, it helps to have a mental picture. We can think that under the hood, a socket has two buffers, one for sending data and one for receiving. It's not exactly like this, but uh, this is a good mental model. When I do a write call, I put data in the send buffer. And then in the background, the kernel and the network stack will send bytes from that buffer at whatever rate they can. And this is important. If I try to do another write here at the moment that the buffer is full, that call would block, which means that the thread making that call gets put to sleep until some later time when the buffer is no longer full or, or some error occurs. Now, this is a good thing. We want this. When all we care about doing is sending data to the socket, we want our thread to block. It frees up the CPU for running uh, other threads or other processes, or potentially clocking down to a low power state so we can save some power. Blocking is good. And when we're receiving data, the same thing happens. At this point, the receive buffer is empty, and if I try to do a read, that call would block until the time when there is data in the buffer, and the data is coming in at whatever rate it's sent. It doesn't have to be this way. We can choose to make our socket non-blocking, and what this does is it changes the protocol. Now, when I try to do a read, the returned integer has a slightly different meaning. If it's greater than zero, I read some bytes. If it's equal to zero, it's end of file, just as before. But if it is not greater than or equal to zero, and error happens to be E again, what that means is there was no data in the buffer, and I should try to do my read at some later time. And, uh, well, now I have a choice to not block. I can do something else while I'm waiting for the data to arrive. Well, what else can I do? <laughs> the obvious thing is to open a new socket and to read from that socket. And now I have these two sockets that I want to read kind of in parallel. So what can I do? I start a loop and I check, hey, can I get some data from this socket? Yes, process it, no, try the next socket. And so on and so on in a very tight loop. And this is great because now I can do more stuff. I have the option to not block, but it's not great because now I am busy waiting. I'm burning power, polling, checking each socket if there is data to receive. And I can't really block on either one socket because if I block on the first socket and there's data on the second socket, then I'm kind of stuck. 
So that's the problem with this just busy waiting approaches. I'm burning a bunch of CPU. Fortunately for us, there's a solution to this problem. It's called select. Now the semantics are this. I build an FD set, which is just a set of file descriptors that I'm interested in. And then I pass them to select. The semantics are put my thread to sleep until the time when any of these file descriptors or when any of these sockets has data to read. Then wake me up and tell me which ones. Or if any of these sockets has data to read right now, then just don't put me to sleep and return immediately. Now this FD set thing, it's kind of like a bit set, except it's implemented in C using macros, but under the hood it's the same thing. When the select call returns, this FD's argument, it's an in-out argument. On input, it contains the file descriptors I'm interested in, and on output, after the return, it contains the file descriptors that actually are ready for reading. So after I'm done waiting, I can check, hey, is this file descriptor in the set? If yes, I can read some data. If this is this other one in the set, if yes, I can read some data. And I can do a single loop. Select, react, wait, react, wait, react. Now select has some problems. The first problem is this FD set size. It's a constant. It's a compile time constant and it's not going to change. So uh, I can't really do too many file descriptors at once and in modern systems we really want to do that. The other problem is I have to kind of transfer the whole set of file descriptors to the function every time. And when the number of file descriptors gets large, that by itself can become a bottleneck. What's more is, yeah, when I do a select call, I have to kind of register my interest in these file descriptors. And after this call returns, it has to unregister the interest in those file descriptors. And that needs to happen every time. Well, what if it didn't need to happen every time? What if we could make the kernel remember on our behalf which file descriptors we care about. Well, that's what epoll is. Epoll, uh, it's kind of a data structure inside the kernel, like a map of file descriptors. And we can add file descriptors to this map. We can tell it what events we care about, and the kernel will remember for us what the file descriptors are. And what that means is when it's time to wait, we don't need to transfer the file descriptors every time. We just need to tell it, hey, I want to wait for any of the file descriptors I've put in before. And this is really nice. Now, this wait, it has the same semantics. Wait until any of the file descriptors I've put in become readable. Or if they're readable right now, return immediately. And then I can examine the returned event for which file descriptors are ready and read data from them. And I can do this in a loop just as before, wait, react, wait, react. It's the same pattern. And this is, a, I've seen this referred to as the Unix readiness model, which is, you know, we do the initial setup, then we wait for the events, which is blocking, and then we react to those events, which is non-blocking. And if we want to stop, we just break out of a loop and close all the file descriptors. And this, in my opinion, is very powerful we now have very good control over when to block and what we block for. And one example where this kind of thing is very, very useful is when establishing connections. So the way establishing connections usually works is, uh, let's say I'm, I want, I'm a browser, I want to connect to a website, let's say Bloomberg.com. Well, we can't connect to that string, we need to transfer, convert it to an address, to an IP address, which we do by asking a DNS server, hey, where's Bloomberg.com? It responds, here's an IP address. We then use that IP address to establish a connection. And then we do the regular three-way handshake, syn, synac, ac, connection is established. At least this is what I was taught in college of how this stuff works. In reality, it's not quite so simple. 
what happens in reality is we ask our DNS server, hey, where's Bloomberg.com? We get back more than one address. Now, why do we get back more than one address? A whole bunch of reasons, load balancing, proxies, mirrors, caches, whatever. What matters to us is that we should be able to get to Bloomberg.com by connecting to any of these addresses. So how can we do that? Well, one approach is, let's try them in order. Connect to the first one. If it succeeds, great. If it fails, connect to the second one. The problem with that is, TCP timeouts by default are quite long. And if we're a web browser and the user is sitting there waiting for her page to load, and we're waiting for the entire TCP timeout for the first IP address, when the second one would have worked pretty fast, the user's not happy. The other alternative is to try both at once, to try both in parallel. The problem with that is we're establishing a whole bunch of connections, two in this case, but potentially more in general, and we're going to throw away all but one of them. That's wasting our resources establishing connections that we're going to throw away. That's wasting the server's resources accepting connections that we're not going to use. And that's wasting the network's resources opening up all these useless connections. So that's not great either. But there is a better approach. It is described by this algorithm called the Happy Eyeballs algorithm. And the way it works is kind of like this. We start by establishing a connection to one of the IP addresses, per perhaps the first one. Then we wait some amount of time. In the background, the first connection is still in flight. We're waiting for the ACK to come back. But if nothing comes back in the, some period, let's say 250 milliseconds, then we establish a connection to the second IP address. And at this point, we will wait for whichever one completes first. If, if the second connection completes first, then we're going to use that connection. We'll acknowledge it. But we'll be a good citizen and tell the first server that, hey, we're not going to connect anymore. Just drop it. And now our connection is established. We can use select to implement this algorithm in a fairly straightforward way. So let's put that in the function. I want to connect to one of these addresses. The way I do that, and there's a lot of code here, but I'll break it up. First, we create an epoll object. This is the object we're going, that, where we're going to store the file descriptors we're interested in. Then, for each address in the socket, sorry, for each address in the input, we will create a socket and connect to that address. Now that connect call right there that's a non-blocking call. It's going to return immediately, and in the background, the kernel would try to establish a connection on our behalf. Then we add that socket to the epoll object, and then we wait. We wait for any of the things in the epoll object so far for up to 250 milliseconds. And then we process the events. The events are going to be potentially an event for all the sockets we've created so far. If the event says the socket is writable, then that's a connection. We've established it. We can just return it. That's the one we're going to use. Otherwise, we're going to kind of like give up that connection, uh, close it out and destroy it and whatever, and then repeat the loop. Go to the next address and the next and the next. If we get to an address that is successfully established, if we get to a connection that is successfully established, then that's the one we use. Otherwise, we run out of addresses to try, the loop terminates, and we fail. This implements the algorithm, more or less. It's great, but there's a problem. What happens if, while the user is waiting for the connection to be established, they change their mind? They hit X on the tab. No more connection needed. Well, this algorithm, this function, it, it's going to keep going until succe it succeeds or fails. We want it to kind of stop. Well, fortunately for us, we can do that using sockets. Instead of taking, sorry, instead of returning the result as a return value, we're going to take an out socket. Now, this is a Unix domain socket, and one of the cool things Unix domain sockets allow us to do is to send file descriptors. The details of how aren't important, just let's say it's possible. 
Now the function changes in two places. The first place is, is the first place is we add our out socket to our epoll object, and we register for epoll hub, which is to say, wake me up when the socket gets closed by the other end. The rest of the function looks more or less the same until the point where we wait and react to the events that we received. Now I check the event. If the event is the output socket, that means that the other side of that socket got closed. Whatever wanted this connection no longer does. I can give up, just return early, we're done, nobody cares about our output. Otherwise, I'm going to check the event, check if it's a connection, check if it's established, and if it is, I'm going to send the corresponding file descriptor over the socket, and then I'm done. This is quite powerful. Now we have very natural cancellation built in by just paying attention to when the output socket gets closed. Now, so far I've shown you lots of what is essentially C code, and I think it's really useful if we had something like this in C++. So let's do it. Uh, let's write code that does this but in C++. I think we can. So now the function, instead of taking a socket, it takes a right handle, which is a C++ object that behaves kind of like a socket does. We're going to instantiate a select object, which is our C++ equivalent of an epoll. We're going to insert our output socket in this select object, and we're going to say, hey, let me know if this thing gets closed. We're also going to set a timer that kind of staggers our connection so that we wait before establishing the next one. And then we're going to start a loop. One important thing on this slide is, initially, we set our next connection timer to trigger right now. So it's going to trigger immediately. Now in our loop, we're going to, hey, select, wait until one of the things we care about happens. And then we're going to react to what the thing was. If the result is the output socket getting closed, then the result doesn't matter, and we can just bail out. Otherwise, if the result is one of the connections that we have opened so far, then we can check whether it's connected and either produce it to the output or take it out of our sets. Otherwise, it's the timer that triggered, and it's time to start the next connection. And let's look at detail at those branches. So the check connection status is similar to what we had before. If uh, the event for the socket is uh, it's ready for writing, then that's an established connection. We can send that connection to the output and return. And return kind of destroys all the locals, all the RAII cleans everything up, we don't need to worry about it. Otherwise, this connection has failed, we should erase it from our sets and then establish a new one. And when establishing a new connection, well, we've got to check, are there more connections to establish? If so, let's create one, add it to our select object, and schedule the delay for 250 milliseconds from now. Otherwise, we're out of connections. All the connections we've tried so far have failed. We just return. And this return is important because it destroys the right handle that is our input argument. And what that means is the other side will notice that, hey, it's closed, therefore the connection attempt has failed. So far this has been written as though it was blocking threads. But it doesn't need to be. The only part of this whole algorithm that cares about waiting at all is the select.wait call. And that could be block the thread by waiting on the condition variable, and or it could be co await. And this whole thing is now a coroutine. By just changing this one little piece, the waiting piece, all the other code is unchanged. And this is what I think is the power of splitting the code apart. The regular code doesn't care how we wait, just the waiting code does. Next, I'd like to talk about pipes. Uh, not this kind of pipe, but the Unix pipe. And the reason I want to talk about pipes is that they're kind of the most fundamental socket. 
by looking at this, we can kind of get all the details out. And under the hood, uh, we can think of pipe as just a buffer. One of the file descriptors puts stuff in the buffer, the other of the file descriptors gets stuff out of the buffer. And this has all the same blocking behavior as sockets. If a buffer is full and I want to write, I block. If a buffer is empty and I want to read, I block. But let's do it in C++. Where we have read handles and write handles that point to some shared state that holds the buffer and other stuff. Now, uh, one little note about the protocol. Remember, for reads and writes, they used to return an int, and that int had different meanings. Well, in C++, I want to use a variant. And that variant can hold different types, but have the corresponding meanings. Success for I read or wrote something, or end of file, or would block. So success is something that either holds a T or a value. Sorry, a value or void. When reading, I have this char, for instance, or when writing, I don't really have a value in there, I just know that my write succeeded. And the file and block are just empty tag types, and the result is a variant holding these. So that you know what this is under the hood. When I write, well, the first time I write, there's room in the buffer. The value gets put in the buffer, and I get back success. If I write again at this point, the buffer is full, and that call immediately returns would block. Now, read works a similar way. If I read, it takes the value out of a buffer and returns it in the result, but if I read immediately again, that call would block. Now, these things are shareable. I can have a whole bunch of read handles and write handles, and that's occasionally useful to be able to do. But what's important is, uh, when all the right handles go away, that automatically causes the thing, the shared state, to be closed. And if anybody tries to read after that point, they get end of file. Similarly, if all the readers go away and somebody tries to write, they get end of file. So now, uh, so far what we have is just uh, the non-blocking version of a pipe. And we can write a function that will like, read from one pipe, write to a different pipe, do some transformation. But this function is busy waiting. And like in a loop, like I try to read. If I have end of file, no more data, I can, I can break out, I'm done. If it's would block, I need to spin. Similarly, if I have a piece of data, I've transformed it, I want to write it to the output, I try to do that in a loop. If it's end of file, then the consumer downstream no longer cares, I can break out, otherwise I need to spin. We need to build something to get rid of these spins so that we can kind of wait. And uh, we're going to do that. But before then, I just want to like, look at these read handle and write handle objects. All they are under the hood is just a shared pointer to the state, the read and write function, and some extra logic to keep the numbers of readers and writers correct. But now the shared state, it has the actual implementation. It has the actual read and write function and close. And close gets called automatically when either, either the number of readers or the number of writers drop to zero. And that's what they do. The read and write handles just forward to the shared state and keep the number in sync. Now let's look at the read function. To do a basic non-blocking read function, it's fairly straightforward. Check if there's data in the buffer, and if there is, take it out, return success. If there's no data in the buffer and the shared state is closed, that's end the file. If there's no data, no data in the buffer and it's not closed, then it would block. And write does the same thing, but backwards. If we're closed, that's end of file. If we're not closed, but the buffer is full, we would block. If we're not closed, but the buffer is not full, then put the data in the buffer and return success. And close, just set close to true. For now, there's not much else for this function to do. Next, we have to implement select. And the idea of select is one caller, one thread perhaps, 
It wants to wait for one any of several of such objects. It wants to wait for events from many handles. It means that each handle could, or each shared state, could have potentially many callers waiting for its events. So that's a many-to-many -many relationship. And traditionally, the way I've seen many-to-many -many relationships represented is to have some middle thing, some kind of associative container that has some kind of object for each pair of relationships, for each pair of caller to shared state. And that's what the select object is. It's just storage for these relationships. The responsibilities look kind of like this. If I'm a caller, when I use a select object, I want to insert or erase relationships. I'm interested in these handles, or I'm no longer interested in them. I want to modify what events I'm interested in for each handle inserted. And then I want to wait for any of the events I care about to happen. And eventually, the select object will wake me up with events. Now, the shared state, yeah, the select object is responsible for subscribing and unsubscribing the things it contains. So I, I'm interested in events and I'm not interested in events. And the shared state is responsible for notifying the select object when the events happen, such as somebody wrote something or somebody closed. Now, one way to represent this kind of setup is to have two containers, one in select, one in the shared state, and we have to keep them in sync. I happen to dislike that very much. Instead, I would like it better if there was one object, the link, and the, both the select and the shared state kind of refer to the same objects under the hood. Well, we can do that using intrusive containers. Specifically, each shared state will hold a non-owning intrusive linked list to all the links that are currently subscribed to it. Now, the exact intrusive linked list you use, it doesn't matter. You can use Boost Intrusive or your favorite library or do your own. What matters is that the intrusive linked list under the hood is just a previous and an next pointer. That's all it is. And uh, what I'm covering next it's very similar to uh, what John spoke about in his talk from 2016. Uh, now, we're starting from a slightly different position. We have a slightly different starting point and we have a slightly different ending point. But along the way, we will visit all the same places. So again, the job of select is to subscribe all the links and the job of the shared state is to notify all the subscribed links. When events happen, how can we do this? Well, from the point of view of the shared state, it has an intrusive linked list. Now, this is a circular linked list. And the reason why I like it is because we can insert and erase stuff without any special cases for the front or the end or the head or the tail. It's, it's really, really powerful. I, I love circular linked lists. So the empty circular linked list just points to itself. There's no data. Whenever something subscribes a link for events, it is added to this circular link list. And we can have multiple links subscribed. But remember, each such link is actually owned by the select object. Each select object has a regular STL set that is responsible for actually uh, you know, creating these and cleaning them up and freeing the memory. The shared state, it's non-owning. It just refers to them in the link list. Now that we have this kind of setup, we need to modify our functions. So when I read, I'm going to consume the data in the buffer. And this act will make it possible for a writer to write. We need to let them know. And the way we do that is by, uh, well, first we instantiate this notify object. And it's just using RAII to notify uh, all the links that were subscribed to this event. Now. If we're about, if a buffer is full, we're going to take something out, and that's going to make the thing writable. So we have to iterate over all the subscribed events, sorry, all the subscribed links. And each link, if it happens to be a writer that is interested in transferring data, we will need to know to notify it at the end. So add it to the notify object, and then 
the rest of the function is the same. On destruction, the notify object will iterate over all the appended links and wake them up, so to speak. The write function looks similar. We also instantiate a notify object. And if we're about to write, that means any readers who are interested in reading data, we need to wake them up. So again, iterate over all the subscribed links. If the link is a reader and it is interested in transferring data, append it to the notify object, which, as we return from this function, will wake that reader up. And closed you know, wakes everybody up. Because uh, that, after this, there are no more events to watch for. Now, the other new function is subscribe. This is how the select object adds a link. It subscribes for events. Now, one thing that could happen is, let's say I'm a reader, I'm interested in potentially reading from this shared state, but there's data in the shared state right now. If that happens, then we don't actually want this caller to wait. We want to let them know immediately that you don't need to wait, you can just go. If that happens, we don't actually insert the link into our linked list. We just set the events on it and return immediately. Or if I'm a writer and the buffer is empty, I can just immediately return. Or if I'm a reader or writer, but the thing is closed, there's no point to wait. It would just be end of file, so immediately return. Otherwise, the event that this link cares about, it needs to wait. So in that case, I remember that, hey, this link is now subscribed. I will store it in my circular linked list and return true, which means that this link is now actually subscribed and false, it means it wasn't. Now, unsubscribe is uh, kind of the reverse. If I happen to have a subscribed link, but I no longer care about the events that it corresponded to, I need to take it out. So I can do that but only if this link is currently in my linked list. If it's not, then I can't really do that right at the moment, and I have to fail. We'll get back to that later. Uh, this is part of an interesting synchronization problem that I had a great time solving, but uh, let's move on for now. So the select object is basically the C++ equivalent of the epoll. And internally, it has, uh, well, the set of links, as we covered before, but it has two other intrusive linked lists, to subscribe and notified. To subscribe is the linked list of links that I intend to subscribe to their corresponding shared states at the next wait. While notified stores the linked lists, sorry, stores the links that were notified by their corresponding shared state since the previous wait returned. And the, I'll explain what this means to you visually. So imagine we have a shared state and we have a select object. When I call insert, I create a link that, that describes the relationship between the select and this shared state. Initially, this link is not in any linked list. It's only in the set. Then I call modify. Hey, I want to transfer data. What this does is it inserts this link into the to subscribe linked list on the select object. Then I call wait. And what wait does is it moves the link from the to subscribe list to the link list in the corresponding shared state. Now, at this point, let's say I'm interested in reading and there's no data in the buffer. So this link has to wait. It gets put into the linked list on the shared state. At and this wait call is blocked. It's waiting for any events to happen. At some point later, while the wait call is blocked, some other thread perhaps does a write. As we've seen, this write call it instantiates a notify object and moves this link from the links of the shared state to the links in the notify object. Then, it puts the data in the buffer and then the notify object gets destroyed, and it wakes up the link. What that does is it moves the link to the notified list in the select object, and signals its, the select object's condition variable. Now the wait call returns. It looks at the notified 
list. It sees this link, it sees the returned events, and clears it, moving the link back to the to subscribe list. And this cycle can repeat multiple times. Now suppose there's still data in the buffer, and I call wait again. This wait would return immediately, because uh, the whole cycle would complete without any blocking involved. Now, when I later modify this link to say I'm not interested in any events, what that does is it moves it, it removes it from a to-subscribe list. It's not an any list at all now. And eventually I can call erase, which destroys the object. Now, modify and erase are interesting because in order for them to work, we have to have very good control over which list, if any, the link is in. Now, in most states, for example, if it's in to subscribe, or if it's, a, if it's in notified, or if it's in links, we can actually just remove it from that linked list. And we can, we can know which linked list it is by checking whether it's subscribed or not. In this state, we can't. We have to wait until the notify object is finished, uh, but uh, we can do that, and I'll get into the details of how if there's time. So, let's implement this. Insert is kind of straightforward. Insert creates a new link. It doesn't belong to any linked list yet, just a set, so we can do that. Links is a set, we try and place a link with a handle and the reference to the select object. That's easy. Select is the next, sorry, wait is the next easiest function. So what we do is, we lock a mutex, start a loop. We're going to spin and wait in this loop until an event happens. So what do we do? First we check, are there any notified links that are in our notified list since the last wait? And if there are, I don't need to block. I can just take that link out and move it to the subscribe link move it to the to-subscribe link list and return its events. Otherwise, there aren't any ready events right now, but there could be ready shared states, or sockets that are immediately readable and writable. So I'm going to iterate over all the links in the to the to-subscribe list. And I'm going to try subscribing each of them. Remember, if subscribe returns false, it means that the event this link cares about, it's already there. I'm a reader and this thing is readable, or I'm a writer and the thing is writable, or I'm either and it's already closed. So if subscribe returns false, I don't need to wait. I can just immediately return that event. Otherwise, I have to wait. It means that there are subscribed links that are waiting for their corresponding events, and when they get notified, they will signal my condition variable and put themselves into the notified list, so I just wait on the condition variable. Let's wait. Now erase, I find the link, and before I can actually erase it from the set, I have to make sure that it doesn't belong to any linked list. That's what this ensure unlinked function does. Now modify, again, I, I'm going to change the set of events that this link cares about. Before I do that, I need to make sure that it's not in any of the intrusive circular linked lists. And then, after I've made sure of that fact, I check, is this link interested in any events at all? And if it is, I put it into the to subscribe list, so that I will later subscribe at the next wait, otherwise I don't. Now, ensure linked, it's a tricky function. It took me a lot of thinking to get this one right. The idea is, if this link happens to not be subscribed at the moment, then it's easy. I don't need to do anything, I just return. Otherwise, I want to try to unsubscribe it from whatever shared state it is currently subscribed to. Now remember, the shared state unsubscribe function, if that link is not being notified by a notified object right now, it succeeds. It, it breaks the links breaks the pointers and it returns true. Otherwise, this link is currently inside of some notify object on a different thread. 
and I have to wait until that notify object is done. And for that purpose, each link contains a condition variable that gets notified also. So I have to wait. This thread has to wait until this link is really unlinked. But afterwards, good, it's done. I'm, I can go. And this kind of dictates the structure of the notify. When I append a link to a notify object, I have to keep track that, hey, this link is being notified right now, so other threads don't touch it for a while. And finally, in the destructor of the notify object, I iterate over all the links. I clear the subscribed and notify flags, which is like telling the other threads that, hey, this thing is good to go. And then I notify both condition variables, one inside the link, which wakes up any threads waiting to unlink it, and one inside the select, which wakes up any threads waiting for events. And that's it. That's the select object. With a structure like this, we can now do stuff like I showed at the start. We can create a select object, insert a bunch of handles, control which events we care about for each handle, then wait for the next handle to be ready with the events we cared about, and handle it, so to speak. But uh, there's more we can do. What I described so far is just kind of a read and write handle for a single character. We can kind of send and receive a single character at a time. This makes it very easy to talk about in a presentation. But uh, we can make changes here. What if instead of reading one character, we read a span? And this is a span of mutable characters where we can put data, and in case of success, we return the number of characters put there. Or when we're writing, we take a span of immutable characters, and on success, we return how many characters we wrote. That maps very well to the actual sockets interface. Like at, at work, I have real code that adds abstractions like these over actual sockets. It works very nicely. Or what if we don't want to deal with characters, we want to deal with actual objects? I can make the read handle return any type on success, and the write handle take any type. And these are channels. Like in Go, really, just like that. We can do this, because under the hood, the waiting mechanism is the same. And I'm very happy to have time to touch on centers. Uh, Eric Niebler has this very excellent talk where he actually implements centers receivers, and it's, it's really, really nice. It helped formulate my mental picture of how centers receivers work. And just earlier in this conference, we had another talk, A Pattern Language for Expressing Concurrency by Lucian. I hope I'm saying your name right. Very good talk. Less code, but more visual, but very, very good. I love this talk. Thank you, Lucian. So the idea here is what we started with is uh, the shared state. The select is responsible for subscribing and unsubscribing to a shared state, and the shared state is responsible for notifying the select object when events happen. Well, if we have senders, that could be the operation state what we need to do is to kind of glue together the protocol, the sender receiver protocol, and the sockets protocol. We can make a sender look like a socket, and that makes it usable with selects. And of course, the caller still needs to be able to read or close the, the thing. So what do we need to do that? But really we need to do is we need to create a receiver. And this receiver maps set value and set stopped to the write and close calls on the underlying shared state. If a value arrives, we first write that value into the shared state and then we call close. Because sender's receivers, at least so far, are one-shot things. There's going to be one value and afterward this thing is done. Or if set stopped is called, then we just call close. No value at all. And these calls are what notifies the sender that the corresponding events happened. And uh, really, the subscribe and unsubscribe mechanism is exactly the same. It can live beside the operation state. 
all we need to do is just hook up the notifications. Now, the reader, the caller, can still call read and close. If it calls read and there's a value in the operation state, it takes it out. If it calls read and there's no value, it just returns would block. No waiting involved. But it can also call close. And when the caller calls close, we just need to let the operation state involved know that, hey, we, we don't care about you anymore, just like, request stop. That's it. That's all it takes to make it possible to select from among several senders. And at this point, I'd like to make a remark that this is different from when any. When any, as specified in the proposal, takes a whole bunch of senders, waits for the first of them to be ready, and then throws away the rest. We get at most one result out. This thing here that I'm talking about is not when any, it's wait for any. So I wait for any of the senders to produce a value or error or whatever. But I don't throw away the rest. I have freedom to choose what to do. Maybe I wait for another center, maybe I don't. These things are decoupled. Now, we pay some overhead from this decoupling. One of the big benefits of senders receivers is by knowing at compile time what to do with the result, we can optimize very well. Here, we don't know at compile time what we'll do. We pay the overhead, but we get the flexibility. And finally, select itself could be a center. As I wrote it so far, it has a condition variable in there and the wait function called blocks the calling thread. It doesn't need to. Instead, we, we can make select a sender and instead of having a condition variable, we store a pointer to some operation state that just knows how to send a value, but it's abstract because we don't know what the receiver will be. So we have to implement some operation state for a particular receiver. And it does two things. One is we have to implement the set value to tell the receiver that, hey, here's the result. And the other is the run function. Now, the run function gets the body of what the wait function used to do. And that's important, because we don't always block. If, there's, if there are events in the notified list, then we don't need to block. We can just immediately uh, put the value or put the events in the receiver. Or as we iterate over to the to subscribe list, if there happen to be shared state that are ready right now, we can put those events in the receiver immediately. And, on, and otherwise, if there aren't, then we just store a pointer to the operation state in the select. And this, that's all the connect does. It just builds the operation state with references to the receiver and with the receiver. Sorry. It builds the operation state with a reference to the center and moving the receiver inside. Finally, we need to change the notify. It used to notify condition variables, but now all it needs to do is check, is there an operation state waiting for events? If so, take it out and put the events in it. Otherwise, put the events in the notified link list for any future calls to be able to read. So now, uh, because, because centers are awaitable, or at least this center is, it becomes easy to just attach arbitrary receivers to a select object. We can do sync wait, which brings us right back to blocking the calling thread. Or we can do call await, perhaps with some magical overload of the call await operators that converts the sender into an awaitable. But this is it. And this is the lesson I learned from sockets. It's a split the code up. To act without blocking, which is just straight line code, to wait, and we have very fine control now of how and when we wait. And after we are done waiting to react to whatever happened. We can do this in a loop and build very powerful stuff.